Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. And welcome to 10% True. It's great to have you on the channel. Great to be with you. Uh, ben, you and I were put in touch because uh, I was <clears> looking <throat> to put together a series on the Wild Weasel mission and uh, particularly to try and talk to some of the individuals and the personalities who were responsible for making that happen during the Vietnam era. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but before we do that, it's probably worth mentioning for anybody who is curious or wondering, um, you know, that mission had an electronic warfare officer as a, a contingent or a component part of it. Um, and I will cover that separately, but for the purposes of this interview, you were an F-105 pilot, and so we'll be talking about things from the perspective of, of the person in the front seat. So the obvious question to ask then, I think, is how did, how did you get into the Wild Weasel mission? What was your introduction to it? Well, I was... Um... When, when this first came up, I was stationed at Spangdalem, Germany, uh, had been there since, uh, I guess, 1964, and was, uh, of course, normally that was part of the Cold War. I've spent almost seven years in F-100s and the 105 sitting nuclear alert for the Cold War. war. And uh, one day I was told that orders, I knew that people were beginning to get orders to go to uh, Southeast Asia because of the war. And we were beginning even to lose a few airplanes. And then I was called one day from wing headquarters and told to come up there that I had some orders uh, for the wild weasel program. And I said, well, what's the wild weasel program? And they said, we can't tell you it's secret. You need to come up here and read the, uh, the message. So I did. And as I went up there uh, and read, they were talking about uh, flying around in North Vietnam in this environment that had surface to air missiles and that we would be trolling for SAMs. And I said, holy mackerel, what's trolling mean? Could me, in, in my mind, a fisherman trolls to hopefully get a bite from a fish. And they said, that's exactly what it means, that they hope that you will get a missile to shoot at you so that you can discover where it is. And so anyway, the next thing that happened was we got our orders. I, I was married and my wife was with me in Germany. So this was in uh, December of 1966. And uh, so we had to start packing up and getting ready for the move back to the States. And uh, part of all of this involves getting my family settled in uh, Florida, which was my home state. And uh, after we got them in, uh, in a house in Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, I then went on to Nellis Air Force Base, which is in Nevada, for wild weasel training. Uh, this training uh, involved mostly the main purpose of it was to hear a little bit about the mission because not much was known. It was so brand new that uh, they didn't even have any real good simulators. Uh, so we got there and I think I flew a total of uh, nine or 10 missions. And that was all that I flights that I got at, at Nellis. But the main purpose was to marry up with a backseater. As you mentioned, uh, I think uh, to me earlier, uh, or on the beginning, was an electronic warfare officer who was uh, a navigator with a, a specialty. 
And uh, so we, early on, almost the first or second day we were there, we had a big party at the officers club with all of the electronic warfare officers who had gotten orders to come and the pilots. Uh, three or four of us were all from Spang uh, uh that were there. So I knew some of the other pilots. And uh, we met in the at the officers club and had a party and everybody getting to meet and know each other. And through personalities, somehow or another, we we agreed to get together as a crew. And uh, it was told to us beforehand that, you know, we needed to pair up and they were going to leave it us up to us at this party to decide who was going to fly with who. I ended up uh, with a fellow named uh, Norm, Norm Frith, F-R-I-T-H, who was uh, a dual citizen. He was a Bermudian for, by chance, and his parents lived in Bermuda. Um, anyway, Norm had been a Naval Academy graduate and uh, I didn't make it through pilot training, and so he became an electronic war officer, warfare officer. And so that night, we decided we were a team, a crew, and you were married. As some of the other interviews have talked about, it was a it was a marriage that night between two people, a pilot and a uh, electronic warfare officer. So the nine or ten flights that we had. Uh, was as much to get them used to flying in the back seat of a fighter as it was learning anything about electronic warfare. Those guys like Norm had been in a B-52 in the middle of the fuselage of a B-52 with no window to look out of, staring at his, his uh, queer electrons all day long. And so uh, this was quite a shock to him. He uh, the problem was get them to look at their equipment and quit looking out the window <laughs> because we had a we had a completely plexiglass uh, living room up there to look out of and it was always to them that they wanted to look out at the scenery all the time but it was getting them used to pulling g's uh to rolls uh split s's all the maneuvers that you can do in a fighter that they were not used to doing in a b-52 so after, uh, and of course, we did get to fire one Shrike missile at a naval race, uh, a naval uh, uh, training center in uh, California somewhere. And uh, that was just to get us used to what it would be like to experiment that missile coming off. And they had a simulator that we, we uh, were locked onto and were trying to hit. Um, the uh, after those nine or ten missions, we were that was an in route assignment. We then went from there to uh, the Philippines, where we were to go through Jungle Survival School, which was a requirement for all uh, aircrew pilots and EWOs, anybody that was going to be flying over North Vietnam or Laos. So we went through a Jungle Survival there, which was. Uh, very interesting. It's taught by the Negritos that live as natives there in the island. And uh, they taught us a lot of tricks on how to survive in the jungle. And it's amazing how many things they can find to eat in that jungle, jungle that you don't realize is something that you can eat. <laughs> and even a, even a tree that would, uh, that would provide water overnight if you tapped it just right similar to uh, tapping uh, trees here in the States for turpentine back in the day. But anyway, we spent uh, a few a few weeks there going to ground school and to live jungle experiences. And, uh, and then we uh, caught a plane to uh, Bangkok and then from Bangkok up to our base that we were assigned and that was Tok Lee, Thailand. The F-105s were uh, were uh, uh, flying out of two bases, Korat and Tok Lee. 
and that was all the F-105s, and their primary mission was solely to fly missions into North Vietnam, bombing targets uh, uh, assigned by the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. So we arrived at uh, Tok Lee, uh, lived in a hooch for a while, which was uh, no air conditioning and uh, not too comfortable, but uh, it was uh, like an open bay barracks type situation. And your privacy was be with a uh, steel filing or a cabinet between the bunks. Uh, I had already been promoted to major. I was a captain when I got there, but I had already been promoted and I put it on a month, about a month after I got there. And as a major field grade officer, I was fortunate then to get a half of a trailer to myself, which was air conditioned. <laughs> so <laughs> good for good for the the rank helped. <laughs> um, I guess the the next thing would be maybe to talk a little bit, you know, w the way we were organized and what we did initially. Yeah, uh, before you do that, Ben, let me let me take you back a little bit. Then, so so back all the way back to Spang. So so you've um, been told to go to Wing Headquarters to read this secret document to explain what wild weasels were. Mm -hmm. This is 1966. So, am I correct in thinking at that time there was already the F 100F flying some sort of weasel mission? Um, so it was was it a brand brand new concept or was it new and being developed out of the Super Sabre? Well, I guess it really all started in about, I don't know the exact dates, but I'm going to say mid to late 1965 when they started flying missions over North Vietnam. And the first of the Russians started sending these SA-2 missile fan song equipment uh, uh, guideline. It had all kinds of names, but the missiles were being shipped in uh to North Vietnam from Russia or the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, this, this system was fairly well known, I think, to the Air Force and to the Strategic Air Command. Uh, it had shot down, uh, shot down, as I recall, a uh, U-2 maybe in Russia and I think during the Cuban crisis in 1962. So um, there was information on it, but then when it first started showing up in late 1965, uh, I can't really remember when this they shot the first exact uh, F-105s down, but right after that, they had this mission called Spring High, which is quite famous, which uh, the uh, Pentagon decided they were going to re retaliate against that shoot down of uh, some 105s and it was a disaster they sent these airplanes in low level with napalm and stuff and the the Viet North Vietnamese knew it was coming so they got rid of all of the real missiles and just set up a flak trap with anti aircraft well anyway that became a serious uh, threat so People got together with uh, the uh, in industry that was uh, providing uh, uh, radar warning equipment to Strategic Air Command, and they started trying to figure out how to get this into an airplane. And they they did choose the F one hundred F two seater as the initial uh, carrier of this equipment. And they were the first ones to go over in, uh, in uh, I'm going to say, early 1966. I don't think any were thrown in 65. But they sort of tested the concept, so to speak, of being able to uh, identify a, that a missile site was up through a, a, a warning device that was on an APR 25, I think it was called, that they had a little uh, um, um, device in the front cockpit, and then they had a little bit more analysis type uh, boxes in the back seat. 
for the uh, uh, electronic warfare officer. Anyway, this would allow you to get a strobe so that you could see the direction that the threat was coming from and do the, the we got to, there was no, there was no distance me measuring. So you didn't know how far the threat was away and you got to be good at interpreting the length of the strobe to sort of tell you how close it was to you. Anyway, they homed in on a, a couple of them and uh, somewhere in 1966 with F-100 uh, leading the weasel concept and F-105s as wingmen carrying the bombs, they were able to kill their first uh, SA-2 site, missile site. And uh, in the meantime, they're kept trying to figure out how to get this into an F-105 because the F-100 F was slower and the F-105s kept overrunning them and didn't like to go slow. They, that's the F-105 wants to go as fast as it can. So uh, that's when the mission really got started. And, uh, but we really didn't, we weren't really following that because we were sitting nuclear alert in Germany. And that was something that was beginning to start over in North Vietnam. And uh, so we weren't really up to date on it, you know, because we weren't, uh, we were concerned about our own thing. And that was if we, if they blew the whistle that we were gonna have to deliver a nuclear weapon somewhere and not some 500 or 750 pound bombs. Did you have a sense though, sitting, sitting alert at Spang, that things were really starting to hot up in Southeast Asia, that the F-105 would probably end up becoming the sort of workhorse for, for the um, tactical air command, at least, and yeah. obviously the Navy. Yeah, well, that, that, like I say, that was obvious. And um, there were people leaving my squadron. The, I was in the 7th TAC fighter squadron at Spangdalem, and we were already having uh, members leave and go over there. And uh, before I even left Spangdalem, we got word that um, of some of the first shoot downs and one of the guys that was in one of the first shoot downs was a captain kyle berg uh, he had been in our squadron and left shortly after i arrived and he uh he was shot down and was shown in the in the newspaper and pictures of being paraded by the uh, when he was captured and he ended up being a pow for the rest of the, the war which about seven years he was a pow so we were aware that it was going on. We didn't have a lot of details. How we heard about him getting shot down was letters from home, from from friends, uh, friends of his back in the States, writing uh, to friends over in uh, Germany. But uh, we knew they were beginning to send the people and the planes before I left. So I was aware that it was undoubtedly going to be me next. So, so you, I just you, didn't know I was going to be a wild weasel. I so thought I was going to go over there and just drop bombs like everybody else. Well, that, that was going to be my question. So you, you'll obviously later as we talk, you'll describe what it was like to fly those missions. Um, but one of the things I, I suppose I immediately wonder is if you had spent that long flying nuclear alert, so you're dropping a shape on a target a long way away, is there's sort of an over-the-shoulder toss type maneuver involved in doing that. Were you, as a fighter pilot, um, sort of very current in the kind of very fluid, very dynamic flying that you would end up having to do? Or were you more used to taking off from somewhere, flying a heading for, a, or some headings for a period of time, dropping the shape and then coming, or the practice shape and then coming back? Did did you look at the Wild Weasel mission when you read that secret document and think that's a very drastic change from the type of flying that I'm used to doing? Um. Not really. Well, first off, we, we kept current in conventional warfare as well. I mean, when it, we, we, we would go to, this was back when North Africa, uh, Libya in North Africa was friendly to us. We used to go down there a couple of times a year and do gunnery because the weather in, in the, on the continent is bad most of the time. And uh, so we would 
daily, we would practice low level navigation to uh, uh, simulated targets. And then we would climb, that would all be low level and it would be radar low level. The F-105 had a, had a really great navigational um, uh, toss bombing system. Um, now you mentioned over the shoulder. That was really the F-100. We, uh, we did, we could do over the shoulder in 105, but they, while I was there, they developed the lay down weapon where you just went straight across and it had a, uh, when you release the bomb, it uh, had a parachute that came out and the deceleration caused by the parachute on the weapon would cause it to arm. And so you just kept up your, whatever you're doing, 550, 600 knots, dropped the weapon and made a wide turn and go head home. So, uh, but we, we would practice that, but in, in wheelless and during, there is a couple of ranges up on the continent in France, one called sweeps that we would go to if we had an operational readiness inspection. And we would go in, we had a time on target to make uh, after flying this route on radar, we were to hit this target and to pass your inspection and everything you needed to be hit right on the dot for making your time on target. That would drop the web, the lay down weapon. Then we would climb back up to, uh, uh, I'm going to guess, I don't remember, it's been so long, but say uh, two or 3,000 feet, and we would get into a pattern to uh, do our conventional on that same sortie. We would do dive bombing at about a 45 degree dive bomb angle. We would drop a couple of dive bombs, and uh, then we would uh, skip bomb and uh and then uh finish up with strafing uh, and of course that was pretty shallow this strafing of course we we never would have done we never did any of that in vietnam because if you got below it got to be uh the rule that uh was a written rule but everybody did it anyway because if you got below about four thousand feet you were probably going to get Hose because, hose because they had a, uh, I think it was called a ZPU-23 that was a quad-mounted rapid-firing anti-aircraft gun that would just eat you up if you got below about 4,000 feet. So there was no, there was uh, the, all, all the bombing by the uh, strike force was 45, 50 degree dive angles some of them even steeper than that, depending on the pilot and how, and how his roll in went. Because when you're attacking with multiple flights and the first one turns in a little bit late then the other one's later and it sort of throws off your heading that you planned on, planned on uh, making. But that was the strike force and not the weasels. Uh, I could get into a little bit now uh, well, you were asking about uh, Europe and how it compared to what I was going to be doing. I think I was well qualified to do either one uh, because we did practice dive bombing and conventional uh, tactics. And whenever we came home, if there was somebody flying around loose up there, we always we always went after them to try to simulate that we're doing some air to air, you know. We used to tangle with the Canadians a lot over there in Europe, and uh, they they would usually eat us up in their Mark VI sabers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get on to to sort of the the air to air side of things maybe in, in a bit, but but can I just then return to Nellis? So you mentioned, you know, the main purpose of that sort of um, those nine or ten sorties was to cement the relationship, get the Iwo to a point where you know, he was able to um, sort of fly fly in the back of a fighter without being, you know, sort of completely overwhelmed by the experience. Was that then an F-105F? Um, and do you remember anything, or what do you remember rather, about the outfit in terms of the avionics in the aeroplane and, and 
you know, sort of what, uh, how it differed from the D model, I guess, or were you flying B models at Spain? Um, well, the B, the B, B is in boy was, uh, they were, they never, they never entered the Vietnam conflict at mm. all. They were only at uh, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, and that's the first F-105 I flew. And it had, it was uh, very easy to transition to because it had round gauges. The F-105 D, F, and G, they all have uh, tapes. Uh, so all the presentation on airspeed and altitude and everything is on a, on a tape. So uh, there's a little difference in learning to fly. It was one of those jokes one time. They said, you can't fly a D model until you've flown with tapes before. And it's one of those catch 22s. How do you do it the first time if you can't do it, if you haven't done it before? <laughs> <laughs> but, in, but anyway, the bees, the bees weren't, uh, uh, before I left uh, North Carolina to go to Spangdalem, I had been flying bees, but I did check out in the D model. So I was used to the tapes when I got to Germany. And uh, I'm not sure the, the the question I think you started with was the two seaters at that time was were all Fs. The Gs didn't really come into being until uh, I think they started modifying the Fs and turning them into Gs in late uh 68 1968 69 so, so, and, so the f uh, model you were going to go to war in was a was a stock f1 f105f f um with any well, uh, special electronic warfare gear well no it was stock but they it would go to the factory to have the the wild weasel equipment put in it and, and what was so, that equipment then well uh the front seat we had uh the radar homing and warning raw, they called it raw gear. Uh, and it was that little gauge. It was a round gauge that had the circulars on the bezel. And, uh, and then you had a little pad uh, about this size of lights. I think there were about eight or nine lights and those lights would light up if you had like activity from the fan song. Uh, so it, we had all kinds of antennas put on the F model to pick up these electronic signals. And uh, our lights would light up with, uh, with the different frequency ranges. Of course, the ones we were going to be primarily in this, in, interested in is the fan song signal. And I don't, an EWO could tell you what range those frequencies are. Um, but you would, uh, it would react to a frequency range and a pulse repetition, PRF, pulse repetition frequency also. And if it, it would light up a light if it got activity in the, uh, uh, gets more into the EWO talk now, but the low activity and then the high, acti high PRF meant that he's getting ready to fire. And then there was also a red launch light well, we found these not to, you could get false readings. You could get a false launch light. There wouldn't be a launch, but something in the electronics, like I called them earlier, queer electrons, these <laughs> electrons would sometimes throw off the, and cause our equipment to read something that it wasn't. The most reliable thing we had in the front seat was the little strobes or in, indications on this this little scope that was up here on the right hand side of the cockpit. We had a rear view mirror on the left side. I think there had been one there, but they replaced it with this scope. And then right below it was this little box of warning lights. The back seater had those same things, but then he also had a, um, I think it was an IR 133. And then later on, they converted it to a maybe an ER-142, they had designations. And they're, they're more a larger box, and uh, they have maybe three different little scopes, some that they can tune, they can tune strictly to that one uh, 
uh, signal if they want to and analyze it a little more. And they also were able to tell us if, if we were being tracked accurately, this came into play later on with something I can get with you on a little bit later on in the tactics business, they could tell if that guy was, if we were right in the center of his scope being tracked or whether we were, he was looking at somebody else like a wingman that was a thousand, 1500 feet off to the left or right, because the, he would see that over to the side of what he's looking at him, his scope. And uh, so he had, he had more, more ways to do analytical stuff in the back. And the way we worked is uh, we had a good, a hot mic all the time intercom. So we were hot all the time. We could hear each other's heavy breathing <laughs> when things got tough. <laughs> we could hear all the cussing, <laughs> and we had a built we had a built in uh, 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 reel to reel recorder too to record all of what was going on, and it would pick up the audio signals. I didn't mention that. But all of these signals that we were getting visual representation by, we would get audio also. And the fan song signal was affectionately referred to as the rattlesnake, because it was a it was a it was a very distinct rattle uh, that you heard in your headset as well as seeing something on your scope. And uh, the others, if it was airborne radio radar, like an, another enemy aircraft, that would be a different frequency range, and it would show up with a different kind of strobe and a different type of audio, more of a high tone. Um, we concentrated mostly just on the uh, SA-2 work. That's what we were there to locate and either uh, knock out of action or as it became really the mission later on af after a few missions uh, of mine over there and was beginning to change in uh, by I would say March. I, I arrived at Talkley the 20, I think the 21st of February, 1967 was my first mission, my first flight. Uh, about a month after that, it be, it really became more than hunter kill. It became more defense suppression. Was to keep the SAM sites so busy that they wouldn't uh, bother the strike force while they were trying to bomb the target. Was to help the strike force get in and bomb their target safely. So as long as we buzzed around like hornets or weasels or whatever you want to refer to us close enough and threaten the sites enough, they would leave the, the other guys alone. So that sort of became the way we fought was, uh, uh, there's a book, I think Ed Rock or somebody wrote a book and I think he called his book title was first in last out. And that sort of was, is what has always been, referred to the way the weasel mission was flown. We always uh, were first ones to take off on a strike from the base. Uh, we were the first ones on the tankers and we were the first ones to drop off and head in and use, <coughs> excuse me, usually we were about 25 to 35 miles in front of the next flight of F-105s. So therefore, we were able to do two things for the strike force commander who would be behind us, is we were able to give him weather reports as well as call off any significant threats to give him a feeling of what is it going to look like up ahead. And so we made, we made radio calls uh, uh, freely outside the aircraft we uh, you know an actual transmission on the frequency we were on as well as talk to each other so we had 
we had to learn uh, how to do that. I mean, Norm got used to me and I got used to him and he would, he would only tell me things that he thought I needed to know while he was back there doing his analyzing. And uh, because he didn't want to talk too much because he might interrupt me because I got to be listening all the time too to other radio calls that are on from everybody out there. We even had uh, standoff EC-121s that were watching for MIGs and other things, and they would call out warnings. So there was a lot of, there could be a lot of radio chatter, especially if over the target when people were rolling, rolling in and getting shot at, and if somebody got hit, there was a little, it got, it got really, um, it got where it was just too much and it was bad because then you're losing out. You're not, you're missing things that you should be reacting to or doing something about because one transmission blocks out the other transmission. So uh, I got, I'm getting off subject here, but I think you it's better okay. get me back on something. <laughs> it's okay. This is, this is all good. It's gold. I can, um, I can go, I can sort of go if you want all the way from, uh, how a normal mission might go from takeoff up through refueling out to the target. Can, can, can and, we do uh, that in a sec? Back. Can we do that in a sec? So I, I okay. just before we get into the stuff that, that really is the story, um, I just want to do a little bit more background um, just you know, so that so people have some, you know, something to sort of pin onto what you're talking about. Um, so having having sort of talked a little bit about about the out the electronic equipment on the airplane, you mentioned that you at Nellis you got to you got to fire one of the anti radiation missiles. Can you just talk a little then about what your offensive weaponry was? What could the airplane carry? And and then we'll start by okay. maybe talking about your first missions. Then, well, uh, that uh, weapon that we fired there was. Um, was one they pulled out of the inventory. It had been around a while. I'm not even sure that the uh, British didn't have a version of it that was used even in the Falklands. Um, it was the AGM, we called it the AGM air to ground missile 45 or Shrike. Uh, the Shrike, if I recall, had about uh, about 165, I want to say 165 pounds of explosive. It was a fragmentary explosive, primarily for uh, uh, anti-personnel and light equipment, uh, which would be fine for a radar van. It would pierce that easily. It wouldn't do anything against a tank. Uh, so we carried Normally, we would carry two shrikes on the outboard pylons. Uh, we carried two 450-gallon fuel tanks on the inboard. We carried the F-105 was developed for nuclear warfare originally with a bomb bay. We had a bomb bay. Uh, because of not having enough fuel to go anywhere, especially if you were trying to go from Germany into Poland and hit a nuclear target there, you needed fuel. If you're going to have any chance of getting back anywhere to friendly territory. So they put a 390 gallon fuel tank in the Bombay and left it, just put bands on there and locked it in there. And we never, I have never flown in hours and since flying the, F-105 from 1961 to 1972, I never had anything in the Bombay but a fuel tank. So on the outside of the few, uh, Bombay doors, there was a multiple ejection rack that could carry different kinds of weapons. The weasels carried normally, most all the time, we carried four CBU-24s, which are cluster bombs, CBU for cluster bomb unit. The cluster bombs, I think we carried, uh, I think each bomb had 650 tennis ball size bomblets in them. And uh, 
Uh, of course, they just were like frag fragments also. And then the wingman, because when we first went over there, the F model weasel planes were the first ones. They were getting shot down almost as fast as they arrived over there. So we never had a whole lot of them that, in February when I arrived in 67. So we would fly with with a uh, F or weasel bird in the lead and number three positions, the element leader, and number two and four would be wingmen to one and three. And they would, the D models would fly with us just hanging on as wingmen and they would drop or fire when we told them to or pre briefed to. And they would carry, uh, Sometimes they they would carry usually would carry at least one Shrike. They might carry a QRC jamming pod on the other outboard, but they would have their two 450 gallon or yeah um, fuel tanks, and then on the Mur center line they would carry six either 500 pound bombs or 750 pound bombs. Needless to say, if it was the 500 pounders, it'd be a little lighter and they could keep up a little better. But uh, they get pretty, get, the plane got pretty heavy with six 750s on it also. So that was sort of the configuration was uh, we had a mixture of uh, the strikes as a standoff weapon and the CBUs on the weasels and the bombs on the wingmen were there to uh, bomb the target if the SAM site, if we could find it. So, or so, as in the case of the strike forces, they they uh, they usually had their first flight of four were scheduled against flak sites around the target. And they would they would uh, they would go after the flight sites, but they had the same kind of things, 750 pound bombs mostly, which were old World War II bombs. What was then then the standoff range that the Shrike gave you, and and what was the the process of employing that? Because uh, it's not magic, is it? It's not going to just find the radar well, and home in on it. The whole the whole I it's anti radiation missile, right? So it's it's um, I don't know if you have it over in England or not, but in the states you have all your highway patrol police with their radar finders trying to check your speed on the, on the uh, interstates or the, uh, the highways. And uh, they came out with a thing here in the States called a fuzz buster. Mm -hmm. And it, you guys were put it in their cars so it would pick up a signal up ahead that you were, you're approaching a policeman that's got his radar gun on. Well, it was the same idea. They, whenever they, turned on their radars and were, of course, you had your your big scopes that would just generally, you know, like air defense, your ground control intercept type radar that the enemy had to give the SAM sites a general idea of where to point their radars. But uh, when they would turn on and uh, uh, start tracking, you, you would pick that up on your equipment and if you had your strike selected, which were on the outboard pylons, and we had a little selection buttons that we'd push in to select which station we wanted to fire or drop from. And uh, so we would all be uh, armed and uh, ready. And uh, when we picked up that signal, the signal is also going on through a, uh, through uh, the, nose cone of the shrike is picking up the same signal that you're hearing in your headset. Um, so as long as that signal's on, that shrike is going to want to home in on it. But you got to give it a chance by firing it into a basket. If you can think about a funnel or, or be, they used to call it a basket in learning to shoot these things, you had to get your your missile to come into that basket if it was going to have any chance of of uh, controlling or homing in onto that signal. 
if you miss the basket over here, it's just going to go ballistic and miss. It's not going to be guiding. If it's going to have any guidance capability, it has to hit that range of uh, the signal being where it's being emanated from. So distance wise was the question. We fired those training shots where we could be almost level or in a, about a five degree dive. But that would mean we, at, when we did this in California, flying out of Nellis, our training shots were from about, I'm going to say seven, eight, nine miles out. If you were farther back, you had to, you had to get some angle up and loft it or toss it. And so I had made up a chart that I had on the side of the uh, canopy I got, well, I really had them memorized, but basically we, Basically, you wanted to try, if you didn't want to get shot at, you're going to get shot at if you got closer to a SAM than about 12 miles. I think his range, supposedly, if I remember what they told us, was 17-ish miles. They have a cone over them that's about five miles right over the top that they can't hit you because the... Uh, the uh, SA-2 has a booster, and when the booster is firing the missile off, it's on there for, I think, about two and a half seconds or so to get the, the missile off and, and uh, up to a initial speed. Then it drops off, and it uncovers the guidance antenna. So for the first two and a half seconds, or say three, four, five miles, it can't guide. Uh, inside that little dome, that's where you find all those ZPU-23 anti-aircraft guns. <laughs> so you don't want to get in there either. But uh, so since he can shoot you and will shoot at you when you get within 10 or 12 miles, we wanted to try to shoot our strikes no, no uh, closer than that. And so uh, a shot from about 15 miles out would probably be about a 25 to 30 degree angle up at uh at 550 knots anyway so um at about 550 knots and uh say 5,000 feet uh a 15 degree oh what did i say about a 20 degree up angle would get you that 15 miles approximately the problem later on, um, we could get a little bit more into specific missions and tactics and things maybe later, but it it got to be uh, cat and mouse with the North Vietnamese. And of course, some of these sites that were bombed, there were Russian advisors in there were killed also because that's they had they had their tech tech reps, you know, as we call them. Uh, people from the factory or from wherever the missile came from helping teach them how to use it. Uh, but it got to be cat and mouse where they learned what we were doing and they a lot of times knew when we started lining up and coming straight at them that we were probably going to shoot a strike at them. Hmm. So what they, all of these SAM sites and anti-aircraft people, they were all on central they were on landlines talking to each other over landlines and uh, they would uh, maybe one of them would be saying he's coming in toward my site and he would shut down. So he knew if he shut down that there was nothing going to home in on him. I might see him visually and bomb him, but they would, talk to each other and one would shut down and the other one over here 10 miles away would come on and this first guy had told the second one where i was and he had already maybe had he might he might have his search on search radar on but he hasn't turned on the the the, the missile equipment yet so he's not on a strobe to me yet but then all of a sudden he comes on and now I've got no strobe here and I've got a, I got a, a fan song over here looking at me. 
And we used to, I don't know, do you know, um, do you remember any, uh, back in the day, the, I don't even know, do you have the doc, Dr. Pepper drink over in England? I do, yeah. Well, back in the day, they used to have an ad for Dr. Pepper's called, you, they were, Dr. Pepper was good at 10, 2, and 4 o'clock of the day. They drank through them a day at 10, 2, and 4. So sometimes it got where we had so many SAM sites on that I would call, I got to where I would call out the warning. I would say, Dr. Pepper, heads up. And everybody knew, but that just meant we got SAMs everywhere looking at us. And so keep your eyes peeled for a liftoff, you know, because if you saw one, if you saw one fired lifting off, that booster left, left a lot of smoke from the booster. And it also kicked up a lot of dust and debris from the blast of the liftoff, which was just like throwing a smoke grenade on the target for us. So if, if we could, if we could see one lift off, dodge the missile somehow or another, which is what I could get into on one of my missions happen, then we would just, after we dodged it, just head in and head for the smoke and that he had marked himself and then drop your bombs all over the smoke and uh, you hit the target. If so, if he turned his, his radar off, um, so, so you've, you've talked about search radar, you've got an acquisition radar, and then there's a, uh, some kind of targeting radar. So is there three radars in the system in total? Um, well, there, um, um, there's, there's mainly the tracking radar is the one we're worried about, you know, because okay. that's the one that's actually tracking you and, and the missiles are, are sort of slewed to it. You know, yeah. the missiles are going to do whatever the tracking radar is telling them. The other is a, is more of that GCI, I call it scope, which is just showing a whole map of the area and it'll show a return of the airplanes, but it's not, it's not the tracking radar that you want that you that you want to knock out the one that's going to control the missile. So, so if if he if if you get the uh, shrike shot into the basket and he turns the tracking radar off, does the shrike remember where he is, or does it just go? It, it'll just go ballistic from that point. Okay. So it it, it um, if he waits too late to turn it off, it might ballistically fly on in there. It will go, it will blow up when it hits, you know, hits the ground or contact. Okay. But uh, um, it's not guiding anymore. So I can't tell you, it sort of depends on where in during its flight, it loses its guidance. Yeah. And, and, and so it having... starts, just, just, just starts gliding from there. You're not at low level, but you're. I guess you're high enough to be able to see these things because they're quite distinctive, aren't they? They've got quite a distinctive pattern where the Fansong radar is in the middle, and and around them is the ring of missile launchers and, and missiles. Um, well, well, so are they easy to see or not? No, uh, not not really. That's what we were expecting because if you look at uh, the the standard Soviet missile site. Uh, it was normally referred to as a star, a star of David uh, setup. The way they had uh, the van, the fan song to uh, guidance, the van got all the guidance up in the middle, and then you had usually six launchers around the perimeter, and uh, the the standard. Uh, I guess methodology that the Russians would use would they normally would be ready to fire. They would have three sort of pointed this way and three pointed the other way. And they would fire. If you went by the manual, you were supposed to fire all three of them. Now, they didn't always do that, but they also didn't set up because the terrain, the terrain and uh, in North Vietnam was different. It's pretty flat. And it's uh, sort a lot of uh, agricultural and things, and there's uh, there's rice farms which are water and things. So they uh, 
construction wise, they didn't build that same kind of thing. They did initially, but they almost by the time I got there, they were totally out of that design of a SA2 site. They'd gone to mobile and camouflage. Mm -hmm. If you if you saw if you flew over and and found a site one day and you didn't attack it, but you saw where it was, you'd already expended your weapons, but you identified where it was and you went back and said, I'll get that guy tomorrow. Uh, he wouldn't be there tomorrow. They would they would move down the road. Five, 10, 20 miles away, and they also would camouflage quite well. And they didn't always set up six launchers. They might only set up three. So that's what I said. It sort of became cat and mouse. They would move a lot. Now, I started a uh, method with a big asset, you know, these acetate charts with acetate. You can write with a grease pencil on them. In our planning planning room, I had a big map of North Vietnam there, mostly the uh, the top. Uh, half. We haven't talked about root packages or any of that yet, but uh, mainly that area where all the SAMs are. And our intelligence people, the B-66s and other people would be listening in on their equipment, similar kind of equipment. And due to triangulation and other methods, they would try to identify where these sites are going to be today. And they had them. Uh, they had them uh, with designations call L something, and we always refer to the L as lead. Like one of them might be L19 or L26 or L63. It had a had an identifying L number, and that would they would put those out on the map, is or they would print them out, and then I would post them on the map where they're supposed to be. So we would know when we were doing our pre takeoff planning, this is where I expect surface air missile sites to be based on intelligence. But then we go fly that mission and based on what happened and who was up as we called it, in other words, up being he's got everything turned on and he's looking and tracking uh, or who's not there, who, who wasn't up today we would come back and update the chart with our grease pencil. And, you know, if, if it was in red grease pencil, it meant this is, this is based on a pilot's debrief. In other words, it's information from this morning's mission. So the guys this afternoon know what was, what was happening uh, this morning based on their mission. And so that, that helped uh, a bit, but, it was still, unless you just flew right, almost right over the top of one, you weren't going to see it if he wasn't wanting to be seen. They were pretty good at camouflage. And uh, that's the reason I say the best way to find them was to tro troll. I'm back to the word troll again. <laughs> By going in close enough to them back and forth or at them or turning sideways to them because you wanted to keep the threat out to about two o'clock or 10 o'clock to you, which is your best visibility out to the side. And if one fired at you, you know, it's, it's almost impossible for him to hit you because that missile's going at, I don't know, two, 3,000 miles an hour by the time it gets up to you and you're, you're doing a lot slower and you've got bigger, bigger control surfaces it does so that you can, uh, you can cause it to overshoot. You just have to gut it out and wait until it's only a second or two away from you. <laughs> that's that's the trick. If you wait too long, then it, it's got longer to try to correct. I remember one of the guys that was a weasel, Billy Sparks, they used to say Billy used to like to, like to play with it. He'd drop his nose and he'd try to see, did it drop its nose? And then he'd pull up. Well, you, you don't have that much time. And from lift off to the time it gets to where you are is just a matter of 10, 15 seconds. You know, I mean, it's going to get there fast at going at 1,000 miles an hour. People, so, people uh, describe it as the, the flying telegraph pole. Um, was it easy to see in flight and, and easy to, to keep track of in flight? 
if if you saw it from the beginning, you could because even even these uh, second stage booster, you might call it the the rocket that came off after the booster dropped off was still a flame and it still smoked some. It was mostly a glow. You didn't see smoke. You saw smoke and all that stuff from the booster. But once that dropped off and the missiles coming at you, you're seeing a bright yellow burn, you know, the 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 uh, the rocket blast out the back end glowing and it so uh so it as long as you yeah, you could you could keep your eyes on it good. The one no-no over there was just don't fly over an area that's got surface air missiles uh, in the weather or over an overcast because you don't see it, you know, coming. And that was one of the techniques that they started this cat and mouse game that they developed and started doing toward the end of my tour, which my last mission was the 30th of August, 1967. But toward the end of that, they started uh, firing missiles with no signal on the air. Once they fired it, they would turn everything on and try to catch it. You know, they would have their they would have their guidance beam laying out there where where they think the the missile is going. And as the booster fell off, they wanted it to fall in there and catch it on their control beam Mm -hmm. so they were giving you little little warning that one was coming they even started flying uh, firing some of them ballistically just firing them up up in the air to cause the strike force to jettison their bombs and break off the attack of wherever they were going and uh so that was the reason we tried to keep them busy so that they wouldn't cause the strike force to be threatened enough that they would jettison the bombs and not get to the target that day. Let's talk then, Ben, about that, uh, the mission then, your, your first missions. Um, but before you describe those, though, I, I did want to ask you how you felt about what you were about to do. I mean, I, I, you know, it's war. You are in a, a, a dangerous trade, particularly at that time. You know, people died flying these things when when they weren't even being shot at um and the f-105 of course was going to go on and sustain very heavy losses did you feel um was was there any concern in your mind about what you were going to go and do was was there any part of you that thought actually i'd rather be just flying and doing sky spot bombing or uh, (laughs) you know something else yeah um i don't guess so you know you you the all fighter pilots have a certain ego and it's always the other guy that's going to get shot down, not you. Now I will have to admit, and I'm going to tell this story. The first, the first, uh, I'm trying to think of when it was, but it was shortly after I got there. I think I said I got there about the, toward the end of February, 21st of February sticks in my mind. And it was, very quickly after that, they put you in a plane and you just go up for a local checkout. You take off and fly around for about an hour, hour and a half, just to get used to the the traffic control and stuff and who, who to talk to where and the uh, uh, ground control all within Thailand. And uh, then after that, they try to send you on a couple of... Uh, uh, milk runs, <laughs> we're called, in the lower root packs. They had they had the North Vietnam North Vietnam divided into six root packages. They called them one, two, three, four, five, way over toward Laos, and then six. And six was divided into six A and six B. And the reason that was for scheduling of strike purposes. Certain, uh, like 6B was up there in that Hanoi area, the, the, the biggest threat area, and up, up against China. And uh, the Navy's responsible area was 6B. Doesn't mean we didn't fly in there. We'd had a lot of missions we flew in there. But they would schedule targets 
to be hit in that area. Also the same around Haiphong Harbor, Harbor, which is uh, I think actually in four, route package four, because that's where all the missiles and everything came in at that harbor and the fuel supplies and everything else. But the Navy, pretty much anything along the coast was Navy. And uh, so they'd send us down there to route package one, which just, just starts at the demilitary zone with South Vietnam and goes up a ways. They have been incidents down there where there was a surface to air missile, but I never had one down there ever in the time I was over there. But they would send you there so that you could practice going through the rigmarole of hitting a tanker, getting off the tanker, going over, checking in with the appropriate uh, airborne control uh, command post that you were going into the package, you know, you were going into Vietnam, you were out of Vietnam or, you know, it's like the Navy coasting in and coasting out. They call it the, it, the line when they get over water. Uh, so you do a, you do a few flights down there in route package one or two where it wasn't much of a threat. And then somewhere around your fifth, sixth, seventh, somewhere in there, I don't remember. I, it seemed like Norm and I started early because we had 64, 64 of our 100 missions were in route package six which is all Hanoi area. And, and that's where we had to go to find the missile sites. So then somewhere around five, six, I don't have it written down anywhere. My first flight as a weasel was as a wingman to uh, one of the guys that's been there for a few months and was uh, very used to going up there every day. So we're, we're, of course, all apprehensive. As you know, uh, as they say, fear, fear is usually is, uh, caused by the unknown. If you don't know something and it's the first time you experience it, you're a little bit apprehensive. And the first few flights that I flew up into that route package six, and started hearing those Sam rattlesnakes go off and things like that on my headset. My mouth got so dry from from the fear. I don't know that I've ever felt my heart bumping or anything, but my mouth got dry that I could hardly talk over my my interphone to to Norm in the back seat. So I got I went and got myself a roll of lifesavers. You know, the old lifesaver can, candy and it had a hole in the middle. I would take one of those lifesavers. I had it up here in my survival vest. And somewhere after I dropped off the tanker, I'd get one out and I would thread it. Because a lot of your toggle switches were a little switch like this. And on my one of my consoles, I had a toggle switch. And I'd slip that lifesaver over the toggle switch. And when I would get into where we were about to head in, we're about to get into the threat area, I would take my mask off and put that lifesaver in there and it would generate just enough saliva that I could get past the dry mouth syndrome. <laughs> That's just a side story. <laughs> did, did that persist then for the whole um, no, the more, the more the more you go up there, the more it becomes routine. And uh, And I always said, that the guys that got in trouble and got shot down were ones that started taking bigger chances because they started thinking they were that the golden BB wasn't going to get them. You know, they were, they were getting, they were too good. They knew, they knew, they knew they were too good for the bad guys to get them. So they would press in a little closer. They make second passes, make second passes on, on targets, and that's usually when they would get hit. And it was it was the AAA that usually got most people. Uh, Sam's got some, but it was usually if the Sam shot at somebody and forced them down to below that 4,000 feet, let's say, then they would get in there, and the AAA would. Uh, I mean, we had all kinds of AAA. Is that books all say it was more than they ever had in any one location in World War II. Because we had, we had the 23 millimeter 
quads. We had the 37 millimeter, we had 57 millimeter, and they had the 85 millimeter. Uh, I it was mostly the 37 millimeter and the little ZPUs that would that we'd see. So, so what so my, was your experience? Another, another funny point on my backseater norm. Occasionally, we'd be going in there, and of course, I'm concentrating on listening to calls and what's going on, and looking up ahead at what I'm where I'm headed and what I'm going to do. And he's back there in the back seat, looking out the window, saying. They're shooting down there. They're shooting down there. He's seeing all these muzzle flashes. And I said, Norm, if you wouldn't look down there, you wouldn't know it. <laughs> but you could see muzzle flashes a lot. And uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, some of the times you'd see something zing by, you know, a little red meatball thing go by like a, like a fireworks or something. But uh, anyway. What was your what was your exposure then above four and a half thousand feet? Because some of those are high cal- a big caliber, high caliber weapons that you talked about, which presumably can go all the way oh, up yeah. to medium medium level. So oh, yeah. when, when when you talk about four and a half thousand feet being sort of as low as you want to go, that doesn't mean to suggest that above that you're perfectly safe. You're still at some considerable risk above that. Oh oh yeah, and of course the strike force. Normally we would head in. That's where we got down when we were getting ready to fire a strike or um, there's other reasons we want to get down that low. But uh, normally the, the strike force would come in at uh, maybe 12, 14,000 feet uh, because that's about where they were going to roll in from, dive bomb from. Or if they came in a little lower at 8,000, they would end up popping up, you know, they would sort of do a rollover and they'd pop up and then roll in to, but they would need to be, to not go below 4,000 on the pullout from the, from the dive bomb run, they would need to start in from about 12,000 or so. Hmm. But uh, I didn't remember what the question was. What was the? No, that's okay. I mean, yeah, it was just around, you know, sort of what, what sort of level of threat you were under even though you were above four and a half thousand feet because I, I had read that before that you know the sands were good at pushing people down and then when they were pushed down then they would get yeah. get hit by triple a so the, well the bigger the gun the slower it fires too i mean you know it's like i say the one that was the most dangerous the ones that just puts it out like the gatling gun on the 105 is like a burp you know when it goes mm-hmm. off it's firing so fast and uh, so the 37 millimeter can fire fairly fast, but then they have to reload. 57 is a little slower and 85, I never saw, but it's something that fires to the guys that are way up high. And I don't think they had that many of them. It's probably the 37 millimeter and the, and the little ZPU 23s that really got most people. Can you talk then, Ben, about those those first missions into Route Pack Six? You, you mentioned maybe sort of twenty minutes ago that it went from hunter killer to Sam suppression. But can you talk about your experiences, how those first missions went, and the evolution then in in the the way that you approached the mission? Um, the um, well, first off, they had two terms. They had hunter killer, and then they had Iron Hand. You may have heard that terminology, Iron Hand, before. Iron Hand was really when you had a, uh, you came in on the frag order, you know, setting up what the next day's missions are going to be. As an Iron Hand, you were you were accompanying and and uh, escorting and servicing a strike force. If you were just off, sent off or do, let's say they had a weather abort. In other words, there's weather is bad over the target and everybody now goes to their secondary target. We're not escorting the strike force anymore. We would become hunter killer mission then. So the hunter killer was when you're not supporting the strike force, you're just going in searching and trying to find a site to, to kill. Whereas the, uh, the, the Iron Hand mission, I'm probably more interested in suppressing the threat keeping keeping the enemy busy so they don't bother the strike force on an iron hand mission but after that's over and even coming out if i haven't found something to drop my bombs on then i go into 
on my way out, I'm into a hunter killer mode in my mind, looking for a suspected site or something that looks suspicious on the way out. Cause we never brought it. We never brought any bombs back. We put them on something. And so everybody in the flight now is calling out, you know, that check out that area down there, 10 o'clock low. And, you know, and then we'll circle around and look at that, but we'll be doing that a little bit farther out into that route package five. Uh, that's, still in North Vietnam, but it's not in the highest threat area of where all the machine guns and stuff are. Uh, but I never, I never really answered it. I, I never really felt uh, the, the most scared, I guess, if I have to say that, that I ever was, was a couple of times when I thought I was going to run out of gas. <laughs> I mean, I had been so busy doing whatever I was doing in the target area. I mean, we did have uh, we did have bingos. That was the state of fuel that when you hit that point, you would call bingo, and that's when you got start thinking about heading heading out. And then, of course, you got a place where you call emergency fuel. Fuel and uh, emergency usually means you only got five or ten minutes most uh, left. <clears throat> and it was when I was headed out at well below bingo and hadn't hadn't found my tanker yet. And uh, and we everything post <clears throat> post refueling, we refueled also. And I mean, I got down to where I uh, on one of the recordings that my backseater had when he turned turned a recording machine on was. I was cussing because we hadn't got on that tanker yet, or he wasn't helping me very much by the way he was turning. And I was cussing him out, and I said, "If you don't hurry up, we're going to be we're we're going to be jumping out of this sob, <laughs> you know, because because we were down to a couple of hundred pounds, which we I mean minutes left by the time. <clears throat> Excuse me." We we down to getting close to fumes by the time we got up, got hooked up, and the whole thing is the tanker is slow. He's he normally would be coming towards you, and we would pick him up on our radar. He would pick us up on our radar. If we hadn't seen him yet, we had an ADF capability. We could ask him to give us a short count, and he would do a five, four, three, two, one, or something, and we would hit ADF in our. ADF needle would point to where he was. So that helped us visually pick him up. <clears throat> and then uh, the idea was we would tell him to start turning or something. And ideally, he would turn in front of us and we would come in right behind him. And uh, I've gone in for a hookup, hookup on air without ever even stopping. I mean, I've just gone straight in, plunk, and hooked up. <clears throat> you got really good at it after doing it. Uh, four or five times every every mission you went on because the normal sequence would we take off and we'd head to a tanker and um, we get to the tanker and we're we're a flight of four right so the tankers here and on either side we had like one and two and three and four one would run one refuel first and we did what i call a dance for one re refuel and as he came off, three would three would swing in, so he could almost just stay together on the on the thing. <coughs> Lead would go behind his number two man, so now that puts two here. <coughs> as three came off, four or no, as three came off, two goes on, and as two goes on, four came in. So it. Uh, <coughs> It was uh, it was almost like a dance, and you could you could get on and get off and get your fuel. We'd probably get uh, I don't know anywhere from nine to ten thousand pounds of fuel on those initial uh, hookups. <clears throat> so when we dropped off, we were pretty much full of fuel because uh, if it wasn't time for drop off yet, everybody wasn't ready. We sometimes would go back in and get a top off, you know, get another five, six, seven hundred pounds of 
gas so that we were full when we dropped off. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. uh, my wife's saying, okay, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> it's not your baby crying though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, um, so anyway, then we drop off and head in and coming out would be the same thing. Sometimes in the weather, monsoon season over there, the weather really got bad, even at the higher levels. So sometimes, I mean, I, I've flown a night mission before when I said, I don't mind flying at night. I don't mind flying in weather and I don't mind flying it in combat, but combat weather nighttime is all three at the same time is not my cup of tea. <laughs> And I had I had a few of those. Matter of fact, my 100th mission, my last mission was in the middle of the night because the daytime missions were all all going to uh, uh, that Hanoi area. And they try to let you have your last couple of missions in an easier threat environment so to make sure that you get finished because you've already got your tickets home and everything by that time. So anyway, we finished in the middle of the night. So we didn't we didn't get to get thrown in the pool or water. Uh, we did get washed down by the fire department. You know, they hose you down and all. But we didn't get quite the parade and and uh, stuff that the guys that finished during the day did. But people were lost on their 99th mission, weren't they? I mean, that happened in the maybe later after after you would you'd returned home. But that was a thing, wasn't it? Well, at one mission that I was leading, that we can talk about now or if you want to do this again uh, it was april 30th when my number three and four man were shot down by migs we were inbound to uh hanoi 30th of april 1967 and number three was leo thorsness and uh harry johnson who leo later <clears throat> was given the uh, medal of honor for a mission he had flown about two weeks before this one, before he was shot down, he had no idea he had been, been put in for the Medal of Honor uh, when he was shot down. But he was on his 92nd or 93rd mission, I think. And the reason he was on it is uh, he was our scheduler. He was the senior weasel. And um, uh, he had flown that morning. And of course, he's anxious to get missions so he can go home. So uh, that afternoon's mission, the guy that was supposed to fly was uh, sick and he had a bad cold and uh, he couldn't fly. So Leo said, I'll take that mission. So he put his self on the schedule and he ended up uh, a POW for seven years. But uh, as we headed in, we were we had dropped off the tanker and we were headed in. <clears throat> Uh, we were about, uh, we had a Doppler. Our navigation equipment, <laughs> compared to GPS and everything nowadays, was very rudimentary. We had TACAN, but there's no TACAN station that's going to be set up in North Vietnam for us to use. Uh, so we had one in the very uh, well out into Laos, right near the North Vietnamese border that we used a lot. But other than that, we had Doppler. <clears throat> Our Doppler would precess a lot. So after a lot of maneuvering, it wouldn't be real accurate, but it, it helped a little bit. Uh, Norm had the Doppler. He used to operate the Doppler for, for us. So he had what, the Doppler. What, 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 what is it, just really quickly, Ben? So Doppler is um, a way of of determining whether or not you're moving. Yeah, I guess I guess it's uh, sending a signal down to the to Earth and bouncing back, and somehow or another it figures out from terrain or something. Plus, it probably figures out it knows what your airspeed is. It's probably doing a, a a thing like your basic navigation, where you say I'm going to go this many miles at this speed, and I'm going to it's going to you know, this many miles at this speed and it's going to take me this many minutes. So somehow or another, all that, I don't know how Doppler really works, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, <clears throat> and, I mean, they, uh, later on, I think the F4 had an inertial nav system, mm -hmm. which was a little bit better. But anyway, the Doppler would, um, you'd set in geographical coordinates. Okay. It's what you put in there. Geographical coordinates is what you would set in. 
and you could fix it by flying over a known place. You could update it, known geographical coordinates, which let's say with that TACAN station, we knew what the coordinates were. So when I went right over and got a swing on the TACAN, we could update the Doppler at that point and tell it, this is where you are. And then it would continue to work, but it could get thrown off by a lot of maneuvering. But anyway, we were about, <clears throat> according to the Doppler, we were about 12 miles from where I was planning to lob, lob a Shrike missile at a site that I was expecting to be up. I was beginning to get brief looks where the SAM operator is turning it on and he's looking at you and then he turns it off and then he turns it on and takes another look at you. He's, he's thinking about shooting if he, if I get close. And uh, so we're headed into the target area. <clears throat> we're about 12 miles from when I planned to lob a strike at him if he was, if he was on still. And I was, I was, we were talking about that between us, the front and back seat. When all of a sudden over here to my right was, was uh, Leo's plane and he just all of a sudden blew up. I mean, it was just a mass of flames and he called that he was flame. He had flamed out mayday, mayday, mayday. And then he had he, the, both of them, it was a F they both ejected. Well, unbeknownst to us, I, it, I won't get into a huge amount of detail. The number four man, his wingman was trailing. He wasn't in a good position, so he was farther back. He had also been shot down just seconds before. MiG-21s had gotten, had were below us. As we passed over above, they popped up from underneath and fired these ATOL uh, missile, air-to-air -air missiles at uh, both of them and, and shot both of them down. <clears throat> so we um, immediately called that out. Uh, Colonel Broughton, who wrote a book, I uh, can't remember what Thud this Ridge. book's called, huh? Thud Ridge. Jack, Jack, Thud Ridge, Jack, yeah, Jack wrote Brown, the yeah. Thud Ridge book. His, he's got a whole chapter in there uh, called The Longest Mission, I think, in there about the whole, that whole mission. And uh, he immediately, he was the mission commander. He calls off the attack, tells the force that we've got people down and uh, we're going to go for the rescue. <clears throat> we're quite deep because I, I say it was near, if you look at a map, there's a river called the Black River that runs into the Red River. And the Red River, uh, you've got Hanoi down here at the peak. And the Red River runs northwest out of Hanoi to China. And the Northeast Railroad runs up toward China, northeast out of Hanoi. This is the bridge, the railroad, and the Doomer, Doomer Bridge. It's quite famous that they bombed. But that, so the Red River is when we, when you cross that, when you, if you're in that wedge, Nobody attempts any rescue at all. It's just totally inconceivable to get anybody out if they go down in that area because of the population as well as the, the uh, horrendous firepower of any aircraft in the area. The Black River runs off of the red down this way and is not far from the Red River, but it's a definite... They, these were definite checkpoints that you could identify rivers and bends in the river. Cause we, we used to write on our little flight pad on navigation that we were going to go to the bend in the river. That's what we called it. <laughs> I mean, because it shows up so good. I have no idea if it was a place there or a town or anything, but we went by the bend anyway. So we were, we were getting into the threats. We were beginning to get picking up uh, SA two activity. But when they were shot down, we didn't know we didn't know why he was on fire. We didn't know why he, he was bailing out because we were too intent on watching him because we, we saw both parachutes out of number three. I circled one of them. I don't know which one it was as he was floating down. And he had pulled out his survival radio and was talking on his radio 
before he even hit the ground. So man, you think to yourself, boy, this is going to be great. Even though we're pretty far in there, we're, we're going to be able to get these guys. So we're immediately trying to call, uh, uh, people call Red Crown. Red Crown's one of the command posts, airborne command posts. And give them this information that somebody's down. Give them the coordinates of where they're down so that they can get the rescue helicopters, the Jolly Greens and the Sandys, which are the A1s that used to escort the, the helicopters get them notified and get them on the way. Well, <clears throat> everything just from what looked like going to be success in the beginning really just started falling all apart. Uh, uh, I, a, a few minutes later, I realized number four was also missing and gone down. And my number two man thinks that he, he reports on the radio that he thinks he saw him get hit also, and he think he thinks maybe it was air-to-air -air missiles. So we're the two sh two ships left. We're trying to circle and keep them in sight, so that when the rest of the force that were about 30 miles or so behind me get up there, Broughton takes over control of the rescue effort. Uh, shortly after he gets there and sees them on the ground, sees the parachutes on the ground, knows where they are. He sends me out to get refueled so that I can get full on gas and come back in and relieve him, which is the procedure of how we did things. And he also puts Tomahawk flight up high to re re relay radio calls because when you're down at three, 4,000 feet trying to watch these guys on the ground, your, your radios don't go that far. And so uh, we headed back out to get gas, uh, gave an update on coordinates uh, to everybody. And then we then we started getting calls like uh, somebody one 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 place talking to another that we heard overheard saying, are they on the other side? And I think that I took that to mean they're wanting to know, are they on the other side of the Red River? which means nobody's going to attempt any a, a, a re rescue. And so I jumped into that conversation and was beginning to get heated by then because I was hoping that our helicopters already on the way by then. So I gave them the coordinates again and said no, and I told them they were near the Black River and they needed to get going. So I think they did then launch, launch people, but as time went on, uh, there was no there was no talking to the number four man who uh, was uh, Bob Ab Abbott Lieutenant uh, Bob Abbott. Uh, the in the middle of all this flying around, the MIGs got another F-105 Tomahawk flight that was up on top relaying messages. Their number four man, a Captain Joe Abbott, had two Abbots down, was shot down and jumped out. And another airplane was damaged. So the damaged airplane left and was able to recover at another base in Thailand. Uh, but now we've got four people on the ground. And we're talking to Harry and, and Leo what, very well on the radios. And we could see people coming up the side of a hill on one of them and told them, you know, that. You got people coming up the side of the mountain. You need to get undercover and things like this. And then, then as I'm coming back in, I'm directed to try to link up with the uh, rescue force, the Sandys, who were escorting the Hel Jolly Green helicopters. And I, I did initially, but then we lost contact. We couldn't get ra radio communications with this. Sandy pilot for some reason. And then the next thing we hear is one of the helicopters is having a hydraulic failure and is going to abort. And their procedures were if one aborts, the other one aborts because they, they operate in, in pairs. So that just about finished the day right there because we got nobody else coming and it's getting to be late in the day. This was an afternoon mission. And so uh, we ended up we ended up telling the guys on the ground that we're having to leave. 
And the last thing we hear, I think it was Leo Thorsness saying, get me out of here, get me out of here. And uh, so all the way home, I had, I was, I was actually crying. So frustrating. Still, I still feel. Hold on. Uh, uh, I felt very guilty because I was a leader, the flight leader. But uh, anyway, the next morning we we told them we'd be back in the first light in the morning. Uh, Broughton did. Colonel Broughton told them we'd be back first thing in the morning. And they, I didn't go on that launch, but they launched a strike early in the next morning. And they went in there and after talking to Tomahawk on the ground and Leo and Harry, I don't think anybody ever talked to Lieutenant Abbott, uh, but uh, nobody was up on the radio. They couldn't get in contact with anybody. They'd all been captured overnight. And as it turned out, Leo, I guess, couldn't even move very well. I think he had broken a leg and was pretty much hobbling. But they all ended up in prisoners from April 30th, 67 till 1973 when they finally were released. And uh, he, he later ran for political office, I think, in Oregon or Washington or someplace out there. But uh, he, he, uh, we, we actually met at a convention or something uh, many years later after he had been uh, relieved from jail. And uh, he's passed on now, as have a lot of the guys that were there when I was there. Do, do you, um, did you, did you come to any conclusion afterwards that this was, you know, part of a, a some, some kind of ambush, some kind of plan? It, it, it presumably wasn't um, uh, just a, uh, a coincidence that those MiGs were sitting behind, sort of waiting to pop um, up. I, I made the comment uh, on Facebook here, when we recall some of these things to people, I told them, I said, you know, if I was in the North Vietnamese Air Force, I'd have been doing that every day. Because, I mean, we, we took off, we had, we fly, we launched two strike forces every day. One in the morning, one in the afternoon. And there was always within an hour or so of it. So, so I mean, you could, you could go to, you could go to the North Vietnamese uh, snack bar and relax and have your cup of tea and uh, a scone or whatever they have over there <laughs> and say, well, it's the guys at Talk Lee should be taking off now, so I guess we better go to work. <laughs> you know, it's just, and, and there, there's a lot of information out now that uh, somebody in Saigon was giving all these target information and everything else through right. the Swiss Swiss embassy to the North Vietnamese oh, anyway. Really? So, uh, and of course, some of the information, some of the decisions that were made in Washington were uh, ne never made any of us very happy by, by Washington trying to determine what the best ordnance load was to be and, and what kind of, uh, they wanted to they wanted to tell you what heading to attack certain targets on, you know, and you need to decentralize in any war, army, army even especially, decentralize as low as possible because that squad leader or that flight leader in, in an airplane, they're going to know the best of what they should do yeah. and not some general that's sitting in Washington, D.C. looking at a board of stats and some manual that says this has a good kill ratio or something. They have no idea what's what's going on. And they, all of a sudden, they want to uh, change a mission that requires the weapons people to download all of these. This was the Doomer Bridge mission went this way. They were going to put 3,000-pound bombs on those 105s, and they have to go at the inboard station where those 450-gallon tanks are. So they changed that mission several hours uh, before to the Doomer Bridge. So all of a sudden it goes out to the flight line. We need to load X number of airplanes with 3,000 pound bombs. So the maintenance crew's got to go out there and download fully fueled 450 gallon tanks 
upload 300 pound bombs and all and then upload a download the mer rack with the 750 pound bombs on it mm. which they amazingly were able to do all in one piece they took the rack with the bombs all off at the same time they had to put guys standing up on the back of an mj1 bomb loader tractor to keep it from tipping over because of the weight and and then and then put where the mer was a 650 gallon drum uh fuel tank on there so they had to take two fuel tanks off add a fuel tank take take the six 750 pound bombs off totally reconfigure all of these airplanes and they did it in just a matter of one or two hours which is just fantastic maintenance people but they got it done when the time came for takeoff they were every one of them loaded the way that they wanted them loaded so you can't say enough about the uh, support crews over there and the crew chiefs and uh, I'm on Facebook group f105 group with several of the crew chiefs who were there when I was there one of them was the crew chief of my airplane that I finished in and uh, we keep in touch and uh, one of them wrote a book and he wrote it from a maintenance crew chief's viewpoint and uh, it did an excellent job and of course he talks a lot about how they all sit there waiting on their plane to come home and they know he's in this flight of four and it comes back and only three of them come in on initial and pitch out and he wonders who that fourth one is is it my airplane or is it because they all felt about their airplane uh, like they would their pet dog or something you know? it was very they were very close to their airplane they felt like they were doing us pilots a privilege by letting us use it 